Welcome to the seventh episode of Language and Society. My name is Zara Salashur and today I have a very special guest, Professor Janet Holmes, a renowned sociolinguist known for her work on the Workplace Project as well as gendered language. Stay tuned to find out more about what sociolinguistics is about as well as whether men and women actually do talk differently. Right. Well, it's lovely to be back with yet another um, episode of uh, Language and Society. I hope you've all been doing really well and keeping safe. Now, today um, we do have Professor Janet Holmes um, on the podcast with us. Um, I've known Janet for nearly, I can't believe it, but it's been nearly nine years now. Um, I initially met her in 2000 and late 2012 when I started my um, PhD at Victoria University. She was one of two of my um, supervisors, so I was very lucky to be guided by her throughout my PhD. Now, for those of you who may not know Janet. Janet is actually um, a, a fellow with the Royal Society of New Zealand and she is a associate director of the Wellington Language in the Workplace Project which is an ongoing study of communication in the workplace and has um, done a lot of work on small talk, humour, management strategies, the use of directives and leadership in the context of New Zealand. Janet has also done a lot of work on language and gender, including understanding how men and women um, use language differently, how their discourses differ, how they use small talk, humour, politeness. Um, and as a result, she's actually published quite a lot of books in this particular area, including but not limited to um, gendered talk at work, women, men and politeness, or the Blackwell uh, Handbook of Language, Gender and Sexuality, or her um, collection of papers called Gendered Speech and Social Context. So welcome, Janet, and thank you very much for being on Language and Society. It's a great pleasure. So I think what might be useful, Janet, is if you could please give us an overview of what the field of sociolinguistics um, is actually interested in. Sure. Well, um, sociolinguist studies a relationship between language and society. So they're interested in explaining why we speak differently in different social contexts. So, for example, giving a seminar versus having a coffee or chat with a friend. Um, as opposed to, say, talking to a shop assistant in a supermarket. We, we change our language in each of those situations. Another area is um, identifying the social functions of language. So conveying respect versus conveying friendship and solidarity or friendliness. Um, and we look at the way people use language to convey social relations, such as um, social meaning, such as um, power relationships. So. Um, how do you do being patronising? Um, older people often complain that younger people patronise them. You know, how, what sort of um, strategies are they using for that? How do, they, how do we dismiss people? Um, uh, how do we express admiration for people? These are all aspects of sociolinguistics. Mm. So a question which might pop up for some undergrad and postgrad students would be, what kind of value does having a deep understanding of sociolinguistics and um, after having done sociolinguistic analysis, what kind of values does this add to us? What kind of insights and knowledge and skills do we gain as a result of it? And I ask this question because I think there's a lot of focus on um, the value add of STEM disciplines, uh, that is science, technology, engineering and mathematics, but maybe it's not as clear for um, a lot of uh, applied linguistic discipline areas and fields. Well, um, I guess what um, social sociolinguistics adds is the ability to look at the social relationships between people and how that affects their um, identity, which is a very important aspect of, of their interaction with other people, and how they construct their professional identity, how they construct their um, family identity, how they construct their ethnic identity and their gender identity. And these are very important aspects of who you are in society. And it means that you can add 
um, your perspective to any discussion that goes on. So it's it's very important, I think, that we recognise how people do these things. Um, if you consider, for example, the New Zealand history curriculum that um, is currently being discussed, um, it's very much focused on biculturalism. And um, my daughter-in-law, for example, who's Korean, pointed out that there's very little um, um, concern for or consideration of multicultural aspects of interaction in New Zealand society, that minority ethnic groups are not really taken into account in this. And I think it's important that we acknowledge that New Zealand now has very diverse cultures and their contribution to New Zealand society needs to be acknowledged. So I think this is one example of an area where a sociolinguist can point out that it's important for um, society as a whole to recognise the value of diversity and um, multiculturalism and to support ethnic minorities in their um, arguments that this is part of um, what they can contribute to New Zealand society. It's fascinating um, how you um, draw on the experience of your daughter-in-law and talk about how sociolinguistics can actually help us to create um, a sense of appreciation for diverse perspectives and diverse cultures. Um, as you know, this is an, actually an area that I also am very passionate about and I've done a bit of research on. Um, back in 2018, I had the opportunity to work with um, the UNESCO Chair in Australia at Deakin University. And what we did um, in our research team was we, we looked at um, the intercultural policies which underpin education in New Zealand and in Australia. And it was interesting to see precisely one of the findings of our research was precisely that there's a lot of um, intercultural policies policies supporting Maori um, perspectives um, and of course the dominant Anglo-Saxon or the Pakaha perspective but very little policies and initiatives and programs supporting the um, the other diverse communities um, and this is of this is of concern particularly to me as a non-Pakaha and non-Maori migrant in New Zealand um, it is certainly a gap that I have noticed since migrating here um, I might just point out that if anybody is interesting on reading on the findings of our research, then they can just um, search for a critique of New Zealand's exclusive approach to intercultural education. Yes, I think that we need to look at what um, what they add to New Zealand society, how they uh, make us more aware of ways in which, for example, um, we, we tend to assume Pākehā European ways of doing things are the only way, that we need to acknowledge that there are other ways of doing things and give uh, credence to people who um, who actually, or give respect to people who have different ways of doing things. And I think we've gone a long way in respect to Māori people in this respect. Um, we've certainly um, in, taken on board ways in which New Zealand society needs to see other ways of doing things in a variety of different contexts. Um, most um, good government departments now uh, have ways of acknowledging Māori as an important co uh, component of New Zealand society in their names, in their uh, meetings when they begin with a karakia, um, in the ways in which they include Māori people when they seek um, views and, and uh, com comment on policy and so on. But we tend to overlook the um, minority groups and they have an important perspective to bring. Uh, their ways of doing things, including their ways of talking, their ways of interacting with people, are not necessarily the same way that uh, Pākehā European ways are, but we, we tend to overlook that to, um, to just not see ways of doing things that are different because our Pākehā ways of doing things are so dominant. Mm. That's absolutely right, Janet, and I do strongly um, support that. Now, I did notice that you just used the word karakia, and I'm conscious that those listening to this podcast from outside New Zealand might not have actually come across that term before. Um, so I think it's worth us um, unpacking that a little bit. Um, it's certainly something that I've noticed quite a lot since migrating, and it's, very, it's a very common practice in, in the workplace. Um, and I, I think it's a lovely way of actually binding culture. Um, but Janet, would you mind explaining what a karakia actually is? It's quite an interesting um, question, really, because um, most people think of a karakia as a prayer, but actually it's, it's not. That's too narrow a definition. I've, um, we've got in our workplace data, for example, many of the meetings in the workplaces that we collected where the dominant um, culture is Māori. 
begin with a karakia and it's not always the case that it has any religious components so the the tendency to think of a karakia as a prayer at the beginning of a meeting tends to be too simple it's a ritual component that opens the meeting and it's like um it has the format of a prayer in terms of its um, intonation, its length and so on, but the components of the karakia might well be um, uh, mythical Māori um, elements or um, it might be um, a whakatauki, a proverb, that is the focus of the discussion, but generally speaking it will have some reference to the ancestors, the Māori ancestors, some reference to those who are present, uh, uh, it, there will usually be a reference to anybody who's suffered any sickness or recent loss of, of a relative or death, through death, um, and then it will refer to the uh, current topic of the meeting that's coming up. So it has certain components, um, but whether there's a religious component or not is um, not, not um, compulsory or obligatory. That's right. Um, it's got more of a spiritual purpose, I feel. Um, and I also feel that it's got a purpose of um, kind of uniting people, creating a sense of collegiality. Um, we, for example, do it a lot um, at the beginning of meetings and the content of the karakia that we recite um, as a team before every single um, team meeting is actually more about the purpose of the organisation, what we're trying to do and how we're trying to educate the, the future generation um, in New Zealand. So it's uh, it's also, it's so, I feel it does have a bit of a, um, a, a binding and uniting and collegial purpose to it, creating a sense of mission and purpose for members who recite it together. Yes, there's always a, a reference to the people who have uh, been welcomed, if there are visitors, for example, um, and the the link between the visitors and the local people is made explicit. So you're quite right. It's um it's it's an inclusive. Um, compo it's, its goal is to include people and to uh, to bind them together and to. Um, point out that they have a common goal for this particular meeting so it, has, it does have a very um, collective orientation. Yeah. That's right and what I really love about the concept of a, a karakia is that it's 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 about it just shows that cultures can coexist and that um, not only coexist but that one culture can actually adopt from another culture um, um, and that's exactly what interculturalism is all about. Interculturalism isn't just about understanding cultures, it's actually going one step further and it's adopting um, elements and um, cultural practices um, from one culture into your own. And um, and I think New Zealand has has done that really well. Um, and and the, you know, for a lot of people, the the Western culture and New Zealand culture included is a, is, is perceived to be a, a secular culture. Um, and, and to see that uh, such spiritual rituals play a significant role in the daily lives of New Zealanders. You know, all team meetings, at least in my workplace, start with this ritual and we end with this ritual. It's a, I think it gives New Zealand um, a very unique um, and, and beautiful culture. Yes, I agree. It's, it has a very um, positive um, element in it and the spirituality is very um, fundamental to most Māori uh, people's perceptions of how to conduct their lives and, and their relationships with other people. All right, so moving on, um, I think uh, what would be really useful is if you could tell us a little bit about what are some new and emerging themes in the area of sociolinguistics at the moment. Um, well, I've been involved in just the last week or so in three different conferences, um, mainly in the evenings because they're European conferences um, in Switzerland and in London. And um, so it's been quite interesting listening to what are the dominant themes in these conferences and certainly um, how language indexes different aspects of identity is one aspect of their, their focus, um, how we signal our professional status and expertise and so later today, uh, I'll be uh, enacting my identity as a grandmother rather than as a professional. Um, and we do this all the time. And that's certainly one focus of the um, current interest is on leadership in particular, how leadership is enacted in different contexts. I listened last night, for example, to a, a panel in which one of my two, two actually of my former PhD students were the uh, panel um, organisers about leadership in sport and they were looking at uh, netball, uh, rugby, um, soccer, 
um, and various other um, sports and how leadership is then acted in those different contexts. Another uh, recent concern, of course, is how COVID has influenced our language and increased the vulnerability of threatened languages. So there's quite a lot of concern in multilingual contexts about um, dying languages and how COVID is uh, attacking the elderly people in particular, and therefore the languages are, are very, um, very much um, under attack by the disease um, because it's it's having such a bad effect on, on elderly people. Um, and also the influence of Zoom <laughs> has been mentioned as um, new a new media, a new set of uh, ways of communicating with um, family and friends and um, the conferences that I've been involved in obviously have been on, well not Zoom in fact, something called ex ordo but basically the same thing as Zoom, so that each um, presenter is in their study at home presenting their, um, their uh, PowerPoint and talking about whatever topic is, it is they want to um, focus on and then the, usually it's a live discussion of some sort at the end um, where people are um, contributing from their studies all over the world. So it's been quite an interesting experience from that as aspect. Mm -hmm. There's also been um, a rise in the um, amount of attention paid to multimodal um, discourse analysis, so ways in which gesture, eyebrow movements, eye movements, um, uh, various aspects of our gestures and so on contribute to the communication that we're involved in and there's a whole area of, of uh, sociolinguistics which is devoted to looking at that. Uh, online communication was a big focus in, in the conference I was listening to most recently, which was the Pragmatics Association conference. Um, it has many panels on digital and online communication, including um, consideration of things like hate speech and aggression and how these are uh, conveyed online and what sort of reactions they get. Um, one uh, plenary I listened to the night before last, for example, was a fascinating talk by um, a Hong Kong academic called Carmen Lee and her talk was called Do You Speak English? And because she's Asian, she said um, there's been a lot of discussion of the fact that Asian people um, often are assumed to be second language speakers of English without any evidence except the way they look. And I know this from my own um, personal experience that my daughter-in-law, who's Korean, um, says that people tend to assume that um, she's not a very competent speaker of English before they've, she's even opened her mouth. Um, there's also been uh, social media research, a lot of focus on Facebook, how humour is used on Facebook, um, the subtle ways in which advertising is, is um, conveyed through, um, through Facebook and other, other digital um, uh, channels. Um, there's a lot of socio-phonetic research recently, um, things like um, uh, the sort of work that Jen Hay and Paul Warren here at Victoria University, Jen Hay at Canterbury, um, are doing with more sophisticated technical, technical equipment now. So looking at accents and high-rising terminals, which is how we go up at the end of sentences, um, that, that's a feature of um, speech which can be looked at in a lot more detail with the most current technical equipment and relating that to gender, social background, region and so on is an interest of sociolinguistics. Um, gendered features of language identity are always um, a focus of course and attempts to counter sexism in language, um, sexual harassment through the way people talk to, to, to women or the labels they give them. And um, there are also um, studies of new urban varieties resulting from contact between different communities. So multicultural London English, for example, has been a focus of research. And Miriam Meyerhoff here in, in, uh, in New Zealand has been studying discourse varieties of English up in Auckland um, and discovering that the uh, different Polynesian communities there are um, having an interesting impact on the variety of English that's becoming um, widespread among some communities in, in Auckland. And I guess lastly, in this list of just arbitrary things I've picked out, um, globalisation of English is another factor. So the, the spread of English throughout the world, the ways in which it's used by different groups and the resistance to the idea that British English um, is the only, or American English is the only standard, so that we're beginning more and more to um, accept that um, 
different varieties of English um, can be regarded as good standards in different contexts um, rather than just insistence in the past that um, certain um, elite groups were the only possible um, standards by, to which we ought to orient. Well, thank you so much for that um, very comprehensive list of emerging themes. Um, certainly very fascinating to hear the diversity um, of interest in the field of sociolinguistics. Um, and I'm sure that that's uh, created some interest in, in the audience who are listening to this. Um, and certainly for postgraduate students who may be looking for uh, particular areas or topics to explore. I'm particularly interested in, because I mean, each one of these that you mentioned, they could um, be an independent podcast series reason themselves there's so much to explore and um, unpack um, in each of these emerging themes um, but I'm particularly interested about the one where you talked about the impact of COVID on um, on language survival could you unpack that a little bit more what kind of work is being done in that particular field at the moment well there's been a lot of research in America in particular and in Canada on um, indigenous communities and uh, where in fact the number of people who speak the um, indigenous language is very small and um, generally those who are speak it as a first language is vanishingly small so tiny tiny little um, communities with a very few elderly speakers who actually can use the indigenous language and so these people are very vulnerable to covid and so they, um, people who are writing the local um, linguists who are studying the language are writing desperately saying that um, they need to be protected from COVID because um, once the elderly people disappear, the language, uh, the source of um, authentic pronunciation, lexis and so on of that language has disappeared completely. Um, so there's quite a few um, I've read these in the Linguistic Society of America in particular in their um, publications. Quite a few um, linguists who are studying indigenous languages are complaining bitterly about the fact that these people are not getting the protection they need and that and they're very vulnerable to, um, to, to COVID. And this, the loss of the language, of course, is not just a matter of the language. Often it's a, a matter of the cultural knowledge that's encoded in that language often medicinal plants, for example, um, with their healing properties um, are known through the particular label that they're given. And if those um, labels disappear, then we lose the knowledge of, of that particular aspect of, um, of medicine. Um, and there are lots of other aspects of culture that are encoded in language, which once a language disappears, um, disappear with it. Thank you very much for that. That's so fascinating. Um, and I couldn't help as, as I was listening to you I talk about tribal languages, think of also my mother tongue, which is Azerbaijani, um, which is not necessarily a tribal uh, language, but it is spoken predominantly by Turks um, and in the how in the context of Iran it is constrained to actually only being spoken in in the local environment or at home and how such languages can also be um, subject to becoming extinct. Yes I think you're quite right it's a um, it's not just um, uh, small groups of uh, tribal Indians but uh, any language that is getting displaced by a a bigger language which in which is invading the schools in particular uh, is vulnerable so um, for a while for example in New Zealand Māori was in that position that um, it was repressed um, people were not encouraged to speak it or write it and any language that is reduced to being um, confined to certain contexts such as the home which is uh, often the way with an, a language that's only spoken orally um, is very very vulnerable because the areas the uh, domains in which it's used um, are, are restricted and so the vocabulary that's associated with other domains such as politics education um, religion and so on may gradually become atrophied people won't will use them and the children will never be, be encountering the vocabulary associated with the, these domains outside the home. Mm, that's right. And we see this quite a lot with multilinguals who, um, you know, they they have different levels of competency in each language and, um, and that they're 
competencies are really domain specific, as you just mentioned. And so they might feel more confident to um, to have an argument um, or to express their emotions in one language, um, but um, not, not, not necessarily confident to write a, an academic article in that language. Um, so yes, it, it is it is a um, very fascinating area. Now, I want to shift the topic a little bit, um, and I want to talk a bit about gendered language, as you have done a lot of research um, in the area of uh, language and gender. And I'm particularly interested to understand what some stereotypical um, assumptions or representations there are about men and women's speech and whether there's actually any truth to these um, assumptions or to these stereotypes. Well, um, if we talk about the stereotypical representations of women's speech, um, the probably one of the most um, widespread one is that women talk too much. <laughs> and. Um, and I actually did some research on this. I had an interesting research project some years ago um, looking at uh, the contributions that women made in, after a seminar, when you go to a seminar and then people ask questions afterwards. Um, and I did a comparison of uh, over a hundred seminars in different areas around the city, um, public policy, economics, um, um, science, all sorts of topics. And I just looked at who asked the questions and how they formulated their questions. And it was quite apparent that men dominated. There was no doubt about it. 75% of the questions were asked by men in all of these seminars. Um, and this was regardless of the proportion of the in the audience. If there were more women, then there was slightly more chance they would they would ask more questions. And if there was a chair who was a woman or a presenter who was a woman, there was a slightly increased chance, but still the men tended to dominate. And the other interesting thing I found was that the men's questions um, generally often had a preamble which told the audience how important they were and why they had the um, expertise to put this particular question uh, whereas the women's questions very rarely did they basically put their question directly so i thought that was quite nice evidence that at least we could question this assumption that women talk too much and of course the answer is that it depends on the context so in contexts where women are comfortable talking to other women they do talk frequently, just as men do when they're in the pub, for example, talking to other men. Um, in contexts where it's very formal, um, women tend not to be as comfortable as men are because of their um, experience, um, but it depends very much on the individual women and how much experience they've had in public formal contexts. Um, and so it, it, in many ways, you have to say, look at the context, see what the expectations are, and, and then make your um, analysis. So that's really interesting. And um, I wonder what the purpose behind these stereotypes are. Are these stereotypes a way to dominate women and women's speech? What kind of a purpose do they serve? I think it depends entirely on your role. So that um, in our language in the workplace uh, research, for example, um, women leaders um, talk as you would expect to more than more than um, the other members of the group that they're leading, depending on, on their role, of course, but very often they'll be the ones who are introducing the topic, who are assigning the um, turns of talk and so on, and in doing that they often dominate the talk. So because they're in a leadership position and that if they speak appropriately for that position. So I think it very much depends on your role um, in the particular your status and your um, the amount of power and um, expectations of how you're going to behave in that situation. You could say the same with um, a whole lot of things. Um, uh, another stereotype, for example, is that women um, interrupt more than men, that they tend to talk uh, over the top of people. Now, again, that depends on context. I mean, some very early research which shows that uh, women in women's groups um, do this all together now talk where they contribute to each other's talk. They repeat, they echo, they, they, um, they overlap is a better way of putting it than interrupt. Um, but if you look at disruptive interruptions where the person is actually deliberately interrupting the person to stop them talking, there's some very interesting evidence from the courts in the USA recently that, for example, very senior women judges and um, high court judges are interrupted 
three times, I think it is, um, from memory, as often as men in the same position. So the, the type of interruption is important, whether it's disruptive or supportive. And um, in that case, in those uh, American studies, it's quite clear that gender is relevant and that women get disruptively interrupted more often than men. So you can find evidence that the stereotype is quite wrong in that respect. Mm -hmm. Another one would be that women have no sense of humour. And again, our language in the workplace data refutes this quite clearly. Um, the women in our um, data have um, contributed at least as much humour as the men. And very often the women cheers um, are the leaders in, the, in the inst initiating humour in the uh, workplace meetings. So I think um, a lot of these stereotypes are based on very narrow um, traditional views of the roles of men and women. And if we look at modern um, women in current society in leadership roles, there's no evidence to support many of those stereotypes. So it seems that you're saying that, you know, we tend to carry over um, assumptions which may have been correct in the past, um, but not necessarily so now as there's been a huge change um, in, in the role of women in society. Yes, I think that's definitely the case. And of course, um, we do try to at least complexify the men do this, women do that sort of approach to gender um, to recognise that these categories are part of public discourse, but that in fact, in particular contexts, things are very different. Um, we find, for example, that in many of our um, workplace, um, um, workplace organisations, there will be men and women who work together to do leadership. So the, whether it's a male or a female in the lead role, um, one will tend to take the, the lead in terms of transactional, uh, getting things done, um, achieving what the company's at all about. And the other one will be the one who attends to relationships to make sure that people understand what's required, that they're comfortable with it, assigning a responsibility for who's going to actually follow up and implement and so on, and, and perhaps uh, resolving tension, um, uh, introducing a bit of humour when things get a bit um, t tense or difficult. And the, who takes that role? will depend very much on the um, the way in which the company's developed its um, ethos and its its um, ways of doing things. So sometimes it'll be a male in the lead and a, a woman in the in the relational role, which is a stereotypical relationship. But just as often in our data, it'll be two men, one of whom takes the lead and the other a relational one, or two women, or a woman in the lead role and a man who's doing the supportive relational stuff. So once you start looking at real life interaction, you find that these stereotypes tend to um, disintegrate and, and disappear. And the reality is that um, people step up depending on what's expected of them in particular roles. Thank you so much. That's so fascinating. And it's really good to be able to um, have a bit of clarity around some of these uh, stereotypes and, and whether there's any truth behind them. Um, and I think what you've said really um, underlines the importance of um, having a research driven approach to, to, to our daily lives, really. Um, we, we make so many incorrect assumptions based on our very limited experiences. Um, and but when you look at the data, when you look at the statistics, when you look at the supporting information, you you might realise that you you know that assumption was completely wrong. And so what we just talked about was more around stereotypical representations or incorrect assumptions. Um, but what does the research say in terms of um, actual differences in terms of how men and women communicate? Are there really differences in how we communicate? Do we use certain linguistic features more than men do? When you're collecting data on workplace languages and uh, or different organisations, when you've got a variety of organisations contributing, you tend to notice that certain patterns emerge. Um, for example, um, when we when we collect workplace data, we often follow up with an interview, um, particularly with the leaders, because one of the focuses of our research was leadership, and. Um, I tended to do the, re the interviews with the women leaders and um, one of our colleagues, Brad Jackson, who was um, the, the um, professor of leadership at Victoria at the time we were collecting this data, did the follow up interviews with the male leaders. And what we found, interestingly enough, was a pattern that had been noted in the literature 
um, in New Zealand as well as elsewhere that men tended to tell what you might call hero stories about how they'd come into an organisation and rescued it from um, approaching or impending disaster. Um, and the women tended to tell more um, anecdotal stories about how how they related to their colleagues. But um, there were women who told stories about how they'd come in and in inaugurated change or successfully um, set up a company and made it um, a made it a, a leader in the in the field. But the interesting thing is when you do detailed discourse analysis, you can identify the more fine grained ways in which these stories are told. And whereas, um, and we're only talking about a small, um, a small data set here because obviously collecting this sort of data and analysing it is, uh, is hard work and time consuming work. So I don't want to be over generalising, but in the data we had, the men tended to be very direct to use very uh, simple, straightforward statements. I did this, I did that, I saved the company from disaster. Um, in the women's stories, we more often found acknowledgement of other people's contribution. Um, often uh, they would refer to the warrant that they had from the company's um, members to act in a particular way, to take the lead and act in a very um, authoritative way, make decisions, be, be decisive about how they moved forward and often just quite subtle hedges, just to go back to my favourite topic, um, ways in which they would just slightly modify or attenuate their claims um, to, do, to make sure that they weren't too assertive. So I don't want to um, make too much of this, but you, you can see that the way we're socialised as women is not to be too um, assertive. And we have to present, um, we have to walk a tightrope. We have to manage the double bind that we're expected on the one hand um, to be assertive as leaders, to be authoritative, to, to be decisive. Um, but on the other hand, um, we're, we're women and we're expected to be feminine and to, um, to be gentle and relational. And managing this um, quite difficult um, combination is one of the skills that really good women leaders um, have managed. You just talked about strong female leaders and um, New Zealand Prime Minister Jacinda Ardern is the first person to come to mind. And I just remembered that I've shared one of her quotes, one of her tweets, actually, um, that I really liked. Um, and in it, she says, one of the criticisms I've faced over the years is that I'm not aggressive enough or assertive enough, or maybe somehow because I am empathetic, it means that I am weak. I totally rebel against that. I refuse to believe that you cannot be both compassionate and strong. And I think this quote of hers is a, is a testimony to what you've just said and for me it's also it also shows how and I see this a lot when I look at and when I analyze political discourse how that we're evaluating um, leadership through the, we're still evaluating leadership through the through a male driven lens so the the criteria that we use to evaluate what good leadership should look like um, or what our expectations of good leadership are are still predominantly male driven I think Julia Gillard um um, her recent book on leadership, in which she looked at six women leaders, um, has really captured this um, particular challenge um, very, very well. And she she cites Ju um, Jacinda Ardern as a, a good example of a, a, a model leader who's actually managed to combine those um, skills of being authoritative on the one hand, decisive when it's necessary, but also uh, compassionate. And she says, hopefully this will um, en encourage women uh, to to see this as a way forward and also try to modify the concept of leadership so that it's not seen as something that's always got to be hard nosed and um, uh, uncaring about the um, effects of people's decisions on real people in real contexts. Thank you so much, Janet, for being with us today. It was a very fruitful conversation and we managed to unpack so many different aspects of um, sociolinguistics. Um, so I can't thank you enough. Thank you. I've enjoyed it too. And I hope that it's, um, uh, hope it's of interest to your audience. So there we have it, Professor Janet Holmes. Um, we had a fascinating discussion around sociolinguistics, um, some hot and emerging topics in sociolinguistics, as well as some of the differences in way men and women interact, what those stereotypes are, how accurate they are, 
um, and what some differences in terms of how we communicate um, actually exist. I hope you enjoyed that as much as I did. Um, if you've just joined Language and Society, then welcome. If um, you've been listening to Language and Society for quite some time now, then please do get in touch with me. I'd love to know whereabouts in this beautiful world you are. And if you've got any feedback, questions or comments, more than happy to take those. All right. Well, that's it all from me. Take care and goodbye.